everybody, welcome to the podcast. I'm wearing my George Clooney shirt, which is as close as I'm ever going to get. Uh, today, I'm going to just talk to you about something that happened yesterday. It's not the Madison Square Garden rally. Huh? kind of is. But one of the things that happened in the rally caught my attention. It's caught a lot of people's attention. I suspect we'll hear about it tonight on MSNBC, if not from Rachel, probably from Lawrence, maybe from Joanne. I'm not sure, but we're going to, I'm sure it's going to, we're going to hear more about it. But what I needed to do, which I'm hoping this will help you too, is I needed to slow everything down and understand what Trump said and then understand what it really means. So what I have for you today is a podcast about why Trump doesn't need your vote. He just doesn't. So here's why. And let me just take you through it. It's just going to be me talking. And so um, close your eyes, take a walk, drive, whatever you do. And let me explain to you what's going on with uh, the little secret that Donald Trump had yesterday. So as you know, the rally was at Madison Square Garden yesterday in New York City. It wasn't like most political rallies aimed at winning over voters. All the analysis says this. this wasn't a rally decided, designing, designed to attract voters. That's the first thing you need to know. It was extremely intentional to not have a rally to attract voters. Instead, the event was marked by anger and divisive language. Speakers used offensive rhetoric, including racist remarks and violent threats. It was something. If you haven't seen clips, you kind of owe it to yourself to see how bad it got. Just go put in Madison Square Garden Trump rally clips. Uh, I suspect you can find all kinds of video of horrible things that were said yesterday. Horrible things if you're a decent human being who doesn't believe in racism and every other horrible thing they stand for. Okay, so there was this guy, Tony Hinchcliffe. He is a podcaster and supposedly a comedian known for making racist remarks. And I think I might've accidentally turned him on one time on streaming and turned him off within like three minutes because I thought this guy is terrible. Well, he described Puerto Rico as an island of garbage. Isn't that sweet? And it has sparked outrage from the Harris campaign and Ricky Martin and frankly, anybody from Puerto Rico who doesn't have their head up their ass because it was horrible, horrible. But then Trump's been calling us garbage too. So welcome to the club. Throughout the rally, Trump stayed focused on attacking his opponents, labeling them the enemy within and claiming he would use the military against them if elected. All that's illegal, by the way. It's just illegal, but okay. The Guardian reported the event wasn't designed to attract new voters, but to energize Trump's base. And this is, by the way, can we just do a brief aside? This, I realized last night, I was, uh, I started to get really um, scared. I got scared for Kamala. I got scared for Tim. I got scared because what happened at yesterday's vitriol rally in New York City put a bigger, bigger target on them. And today, I kid you not, and I can't, I saw one last night, and then I saw one this morning. Last night, I saw a picture of a billboard. Oh, God, I can't stand it. I, I, I can't, I can't repeat it. It was so vulgar, but it was a picture of Kamala on her knee with her mouth open. Hey, go, just you go from there, because... I can't see that stuff, guys. It's from the murder and stuff. I can't do that kind of stuff. Like sexual violence just drives me crazy. But more importantly, so I got nervous about that. But more importantly, today, Elon Musk, with his PAC money, has put out an ad that said Kamala is a C asterisk asterisk C. Okay, in the UK they say cunt all the time. They don't quite mean it as vulgar as it is in the United States. In the United States, it's an extremely vulgar term. And when people think they're being British and cute, it's not the same. How Brits use cunt and how we use it are very different. It's extremely different based on our two different cultures. So I am disgusted. But all of these things to me put her and Tim and anybody associated with the Harris campaign, especially higher up, in extreme danger because they don't see Kamala as a person anyway. They see her as some kind of minority detritus. So I, I got a little scared. It's a little scary what's going on right now. But we've been warned. I know it's coming. We all knew it was coming. Trump will do anything to save his own ass. And unfortunately, he has a whole bunch of weirdos who are similarly compromised. And they're all clinging to life like freaking rats on a on a goddamn raft in the ocean. Man, it is ugly. So what Trump said yesterday, um, at, toward the end of his of his rally, he dropped a bombshell. He said, and I, I believe this is the actual quote. I think our little, with our little, oh wait, I think with our little secret, we're going to really do really well in the house. Our little secret is having a big impact, impact, 
he and I, and Trump kind of looked over at someone and everybody said it was Mike Johnson, have a little secret. And I will tell you what it is when the race is over. Because that's when it's going to happen. While the remark seems cryptic, it's hinting at something deeper happening behind the scenes. So this is what I wanted to get into. Like, what is this little secret and what's really going to happen? And what did they try to do on January 6th? And what did I miss? And how can he still mess with this election after we slam him in the polls? But he can. He can. What's the little secret with Speaker Mike Johnson? Okay, so you know Mike Johnson, Speaker of the House. So he runs the House of Representatives and he is a staunch Trump ally. In 2020, back when we, they were doing the Stop the Steel crap, he supported efforts to challenge the results of the presidential election. And he could play a similar role in 2024. So Mike, so Mike wasn't Speaker in 2020. He was just a soldier. He was a fair soldier for Trump and he was doing everything he could to be a soldier for Trump. And there was a lot of soldiering going on if you recall, there were meetings at Trump Hotel. There were meetings off off site. There were all these confidential meetings that now we have the notes for that Jack Smith has produced that showed that they were all all the soldiers were planning all the little Republican. I'm going to be part of this. The Jim Jordans, the Josh Hawleys, the Ted Cruz's, all these people who are running for election who need to get the hell out of our leadership. They're bad people. They're bad. And if you're pro Trump and you think this is all good, why are you listening to my podcast? Because I'm not talking to you. This is the, we got the bad people. Okay, so here's the deal. If the results are contested in the 2024 election, and I'm saying if, ironically, when Trump contests the results, according to the Daily Beast, Trump's reference to secret could provide, could signal his plans that involve manipulating the certification process in Congress. So if you remember last time when we had our last coup, um, we got to the point where the little box of all the certifications was walking around and they tried to stop the certification of the election. The plan was, oh, here, I'll go into it in just a second, but the plan was to certify the election and that's what they were trying to stop. So here we go. Here's the role of the speaker in election certification and this will start to all make sense. And remember, I'm going to talk about two people here and I'm going to talk and I'm going to be changing time and space. So you need to remember 2021 is Nancy Pelosi 2024 right now is Mike Johnson. So Nancy Pelosi, Mike Johnson. And you have two other characters you need to keep in mind. 2021, Mike Pence. So Pence and Pelosi, your peas. There you go. And in 2024, we have Harris and Johnson. Very interesting, but we haven't got Kamala Harris and Johnson. So there's your VPs and your speakers. Well, they knew in 2021, our speaker, Nancy Pelosi, was not going to be part of these hijinks. So they focused on the vice president. This year, because we know Kamala is the vice president, they can't focus on the vice president. They got to focus on the speaker because that's our plan. Mike Johnson's our plan, right? All right. So let me go back. So to keep those two things in 2021, uh, Pence and Pelosi, 2024, Harris and Johnson. Keep those distinct in your mind because that's how the two scenarios differ based on those players. In a presidential election, Congress has to cert officially certify the results after Americans cast their vote. The electoral counted, uh, after all the electoral college votes are counted. So this has been typically fairly ceremonial with two exceptions. The process usually happens on January 6th in a joint session of Congress presided over by Vice President as outlined in the 12th Amendment. Okay, it's usually always on January 6th and it always goes like this. Okay. While Vice President Harris will oversee the session this year, the speaker next in January, the Speaker of the House, Mike Johnson, has a significant role, especially if the results are disputed. Here's the catch, guys, especially if the results are disputed. If any member of the House and Senate files an objection for the results from a specific state, stay with me here. The House and Senate must each debate and vote on whether to accept those electoral votes. So all they have to do is get the states with the electoral votes that will be enough to tip it towards Trump to file a complaint. And the deal is, guys, they've got those states. They're all the gerrymandered Republican states. Those are our swing states in general. For the most part, their House representatives are Republicans. So we're effed. But keep going. If they file this objection, they have to debate. And during this time, the speaker, this is what's really important. The speaker sets the tone for how the House handles the objections. So this suddenly goes from being something very Americans vote and we get our votes passed to holy crap, 
Now it's highly political and it's happening inside the house, which we know is a shit show in America. It's all happening inside the house. So Speaker Johnson can rally members to support or oppose the objections. He can frame the debate and he can influence the outcome. This is why that little tiny man who is questionable, so questionable. I want somebody to find out what he's been doing with that 14 year old that he took in when he was unmarried. <laughs> I want that man investigated because the deal is he's going to have all the power. His role is crucial when the election's legitimacy is questioned. And here's the deal. Mike Johnson has already gone on the record about this. House Speaker Mike Johnson has indicated in Axios that he'll certify the presidential election results if the election is free, fair, and legal. There you go. How can you prove that? Oh my God, oh my God, clutch my pearls. It can't be free, fair, and legal. So if he said, if we have a free, fair, and safe election, we will follow the constitution. Absolutely, yes. But if we decide, see how it's all about him? We decide it's not. If the people meet at Trump DC and have their meeting again this year, they're going to decide it's not free and fair and legal. Second proof point that Johnson is biased. Johnson also expressed concerns about potential election fraud, suggesting that non-citizens voting could alter the election's outcome. That doesn't happen, except we're now finding Republicans are filling out people, but ballots of people that used to live in their apartments. There's some landowner, uh, landlord was doing this there's other some garbage going on where they're burning votes they're just burning blowing up voting boxes and catching them on fire so we're going to have a lot of chaos um and mike johnson's convinced there will be some cheating this is his quote i think there will be some cheating in this election and i think non-citizens are going to vote so that's all they have to do is have the the cover the air cover of sus suspicion to cover them and then the third thing i found about him is he refuses to admit Trump lost in 2020. We're not going to talk about what happened in 2020, he said. We're going to talk about 2024. That's because this time he gets to put his name on it and be his badge, and be all proud that he's the guy. So this is the echoes of treason, death, and the January 4th assault on our democracy. And we all know on January 6th, when Congress officially met to certify the results, things took a dangerous turn. So this is January 6th, over four, that'll be four years ago. And they come in to certify the election. Everybody comes to work that day. Um, but rather than continue our reputation for a peaceful transfer of power, Trump and his merry band of criminals tried to take matters into their own hands. Trump has his, had his supporters storm the Capitol, trying to stop the certification process and overturn Joe Biden's victory. In that case, in 2021, they could not lean on the Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, to support their crimes. They were relying on Mike Pence. This was more than just a protest. Some rioters chanted about wanting to hang Mike Pence because he refused to reject the electoral votes from certain states. That was what he was supposed to do, just reject them, based on frickin' nothing but his spidey sense. Under the law, Pence didn't have the power to do that, but Trump and his allies had encouraged the idea that he could. So they're gonna bypass it this time by not doing the vice president certify, because Harris will certify the election, right? They're going to go first to say how many states are ha are raising their hand and saying the elections were not fair in their state. And you know who they're going to pick. This is not even hard. I'm sure they already have like their team shirts. Um. So, okay. So under the law, pa Pence didn't have the power to do it, even though Trump and his allies thought that he could. And the attack on the Capitol was part of the broader plan to disrupt the certification process. So that's what they tried four years ago. They're going to do it again this time. They actually have thought it through, probably brought in smarter people. I'm not sure, but I like it. Back in the House, back in 2021, corrupt, the corrupt politicians were ready. And here's how we know. They've been planning the coup all along because Senator Chuck Grassley confirmed it. Grandpa at 87 years old, and this man, I swear to God, at 87, and he's still in office, guys. He's 90. This is the, you thought it was Mitch McConnell? You got to go look at Grassley. He's terrifying. He's been getting money for his cornfields from the government for decades. This guy sits so sweet. Nothing has lived off the fat of American democracy like Chuck Grassley. He then would have been in 2021, he was ready to be president pro tem of the Senate 
suggest he was president pro, pro tem of the Senate, and he suggested that he might need to step in for Vice President Mike Pence during the certification. As president, as vice president pro tem, I'm sorry, president pro tem of the Senate. Grass, sorry, these titles. Grassley was next in line to preside over Senate proceedings if the VP was unavailable. So Pence didn't show up. His rule gave him the authority to oversee the certification process, making him a central figure of Pence was absent. So they expected Pence to bail. When they had their meetings and they were getting ready, they had Chuck ready to go because they thought Pence was going to bail. Grassley caused confusion on January 5th, the day before, when he told reporters he expected to preside over the session because we didn't expect Pence to be there. Those were his words. We don't expect Pence to be there, but I need to say I'm old and more grandpa -y. His remark fueled speculation that Pence, under pressure from Trump and his allies, might step aside rather than certify the results. You know what? Pence was not my guy, not at all. He is, man, is he flawed. But I gotta say, when he needed a backbone, he showed up. The one time he did show up. Thankfully, our Democratic leaders managed to stop the steal. The certification process resumed later on January 6th. It was actually like well into the night, right? At that point, Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi reconvened the joint session of Congress alongside with Mike Pence, who came back because he did have the chutzpah to come back and he returned to fill his role as presiding officer. And despite the chaos, Congress certified Joe Biden's victory on January 7th. That right there is a difference. It's usually done on the 6th. That was not a peaceful transition of power. That was some kind of bullshit trying to take down our democracy. Meanwhile, in the House, now remember, the trick here is to have House members say their states didn't have fair elections, right? Meanwhile, in the House, in 2021, some Republicans did try to object to the results from key states, such as Arizona and Pennsylvania, forcing debates on whether to accept the votes from those states. Each objection required debate and a vote in both chambers. Thankfully, we had Nancy Pelosi. She managed these objections by overseeing the House's debates and votes, which showed the process could be used to challenge election results legally. Although these efforts to overturn the election failed, they exposed this vulnerability of the certification process and how close it came to being derailed. Yeah, it was the try. Remember, everybody said January 6th was the first try. The next one would work. I don't know what to tell you. I'm making the face like, duh, that's right. This is what they told you. They tell you every time these damn GOP tell you what they're going to do. It's just that they've got us running in so many directions. And frankly, I personally, as a human being in sitting in California, I'm not going to fight this. This is complicated. This is a big deal. This is that lawyer crap that my dad always kind of secretly delighted in, that lawyers can obfuscate everything. That's like their core competency. So this contingent election, it's called a contingent election. So now I'm going to give, that's your new vocabulary for today. When they go to destroy the real election, they have something called a contingent election. And they is us. It's democracy. We have something called a contingent election. But it's what Trump, Elon, and the Heritage Foundation really, really want. If no candidate wins the majority of electoral college votes, a contingent election decides the outcome. The process is, ba is it back up, outlined in the Constitution, and has only been used twice in the U.S. One with Burr and uh, Raymond Burr and the other guy, because I don't remember my peanut butter commercials very well, but they got exactly the same amount of Electoral College votes. And the other, that was in um, 1800. And we talked about this back when the Electoral College, it was kind of lumpy at first, because how we cast votes, like you could cast two votes, one for vice president, one for president. So that happened again in like, 1824, when they could vote for three different people and it screwed nobody got a majority so that's all the way back in the early 1800s guys when we were still remember we were just founded in 1779 i think in terms of legally in elections so this is really at our infancy and to cite these as being the two times it's worked it makes sense it's what you would do as you're a young country figuring things out you you would have these situations happen but we've gotten much better at this but listen here's how a contingent election works this is crazy, guys, and it's actually kind of delightful, I got to say. I mean, it could really backfire. The House of Representatives chooses the president. So in this process, each, each state delegation in the House gets one vote. So this is where your House of Representatives and gerrymandering really is going to matter, because if you have Republicans in areas that are representing mostly blue, 
areas, but the gerrymandering has prevented it, they're going to get that Republican vote. They have a House member that's a Republican. So it means a small state like Wyoming has the same power as a large state like California. That's also the thing that happens. Remember, House of Representatives, two per state. No, sorry, it's not members. House of Representatives varies, but it still varies wonky. Um, I, I should go look that up. Sorry. That's your site. There's your homework. To win, a candidate needs the support of at least 26 state delegations. This setup can favor Republicans as they control, can currently control more state delegations, even if the Democrats have more overall um, seats in the House. So it's state delegations, okay? And But, okay, so the House of Representatives chooses the president. What, what? The Senate chooses the vice president? And that's true. Each senator has one vote and the two top presidential candidates are considered and a simple majority of 51 votes is needed to decide the vice president. It could lead to a split result where the president and the vice president are from different parties. They could literally put walls with Trump, which, by the way, is better. It's better because J.D. Vance is a bad guy. J.D. Vance is the guy we all need to be afraid of. He, Elon, Teal, those guys are the ones we need to worry about. Trump is just fucking empty suit. Excuse me, just an empty suit. So the problem with this whole contingent election thing is it takes it out of voting and the power of the people. And it is a process that is inherently political. The Speaker of the House becomes a central figure in guiding the House's response. And in a highly polarized Congress, the Speaker could wield significant influence over which candidate is chosen. This makes Speaker Mike Johnson's relationship with Trump critical, especially given Johnson's past support for doing things that are against the Constitution. So what does it mean for our democracy? A contingent election really is going to be really, really bad for our democracy. It raises serious questions about fairness, and it shifts the power from the public to Congress, meaning the presidency could be decided by political maneuvering, maneuvering rather than voter choice. It's allowed under the Constitution, but it goes against the idea of majority rules. And Vanity Fair did an article explaining that the procedural tactics instead of voter turnout could make people lose trust in the election process. Oh, my God, I would. Potentially causing long-term harm to democracy. And this is why Trump doesn't need any votes. He has it locked up. His strategy, as seen in his rally rhetoric and his little secret with Mike Johnson, suggests he's relying more on legal and procedural tactics than on mobilizing voters. Go read anything about Trump's voter mobilization. It sucks. It's terrible. He paid Elon. Elon paid people. They didn't care. They faked it. It's all a big hot mess. This approach could make individual votes feel less impactful, especially if the election is decided in Congress. It's a high stakes gamble that puts democracy at risk. And it focuses on winning by any means rather than winning widespread voter support. And here's what you need to do. Never has Trump asked for a vote. He just doesn't do it. I love that Kamala walks around and says, I'm here to earn your vote. That's politics. That's what you're supposed to do as a candidate. I hope you enjoyed today's podcast. Um, we only have a few more days, guys. We're down to the wire. It's, it's in a week. I'm doing a nighttime, um, the night before the election, Monday night. We're doing a Zoom. It's just a bunch of us sitting around shooting the shit. You don't have to have your camera on. If you want to join, there's a link in the in the blog. All you have to do is register because I'm trying to keep uh, trolls at bay if possible. Come on in, take a listen, and join us. It's really for the people who follow the podcast. Thank you for listening, and I'll talk to you soon.